So hey guys, uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, a topic that doesn't really show up much, um, but it's still uh, very interesting and useful. Uh, so we're going to be talking about heavy light decomposition. So basically the idea behind HLD is um, you want to basically do like seg tree style problems except on a tree rather than an array. Um, so like one problem could be like you have a tree where every vertex has some integer value um, and you want to do two types of queries like relatively quickly, like faster than linear time. Um, you want to be able to reset the values at any vertex um, and print the sum of values along any path in the tree. So like you'll be given two vertices and you print the sum along the path between them. Um, so if you have a problem like this where there's no updates, like none of these set AV equals K, um, it's usually much easier to do with binary lifting. Um, but if you have these updates, then that doesn't work anymore. So you need basically HLD. All right, makes sense. Okay. So the main idea behind HLD is uh, the heavy versus light edges. So for every vertex, um, we look at the sizes of the subtrees of all of its children. So like, let's say you're looking at this vertex. This subtree is size two and size one, size six and size seven. And whichever one is the biggest, um, we mark that edge as heavy. So out of these four edges, this one goes to the biggest subtree, so we mark it as heavy. And if you have a tie, you can break the tie arbitrarily. It doesn't matter. Um, and then we're going to designate all the other edges as light. And so what you can notice is that this sort of divides up the vertices into these chains, which are the different colors here. Oh. Um, and like the chains are like completely disjoint. They don't like overlap at all. Um, so yeah. And then the important thing about how we break this up is that because of the way we do this, uh, every path from the root to any other node contains at most log n light edges. Because notice that every time you go onto a light edge, you're uh, basically cutting your subtree size at least in half. Right? So like if you're going from the 17 down to the 6, this one is like at, at most half the size. Um, because if it was more than half the size, then this would be the heavy edge. OK, so we can get from the root to any other node going over at most log n light edges. And because of this, we can also go between any two nodes using at most um, log mo at most O log n light edges, um, because you sort of think of it as like a path up and a path down to get between any two nodes. And each one of those is at most log n. So OK, any, any path between any two of them has at most log n light edges, which means you're also using at most log n like pieces of heavy paths. Um, because every time you go between two heavy paths, you have to go over a light edge. Like if you go between the blue and the green, that's one light edge. And the green and the red is another one. So you have at most log n there. Uh, so any questions on any of this so far? All right. Oh, wait, I have one question. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to get better than log squared, like using some fancy thing, or just no? Um, not that I know of. So, OK, the updates are, are only log, uh, but the queries are log squared. And I'm not sure if there's a better way to do that. But yeah, not right. that I know of. Uh, using other method is definitely possible to do better. Uh, using like the, the Euler tour thing to get log in. But, but in this one, I don't, I don't know about HLD. Oh, the Euler tour thing? Yeah. If you oh, yeah I, I need to learn that. There's a problem yeah. with this where you're adding shit up, right? And then updating. OK. Yeah. Uh -huh. Actually, I'll ask the other question later. Okay. I, I have another question. How do you know you, you're not going to use two light edges like between, to get from one heavy path to another heavy path? Oh, no, you could. So like you could have something like this, right? But I mean, if you think about it, you're really going between three different heavy paths here. Because you're going between the blue to the red to the green. That makes sense. OK. OK. Um, yeah, so Jason just joined. I can go over really quickly what we did so far. It wasn't much. Basically, uh, we want to 
uh, be able to do a problem on a tree where like you can update the value of a vertex um, and also query the sum on a path, basically. And so the way we're doing this, yeah. yeah. And so what you do is you look at all your children for whichever one is the biggest subtree and you mark that edge as heavy and you mark the other ones as light. Um, and then any path is going to use at most log n light edges, basically. What's the difference between heavy and light again? So heavy is from a vertex to its child that has the biggest subtree, basically. Okay. So like, I don't, oh, I'm not children. Yeah. So like for the 17, the children's sizes are 2, 1, 6, and 7. So 7 is the biggest one. So we mark this edge as heavy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, that's what we had so far. Okay. All right, um, and so we are gonna use the idea of uh, segment trees, which we talked about in one of these lectures a while ago, um, but sort of like the exact way that the segment tree works isn't really important here. Uh, we just basically need to know like what they do essentially. Uh, so with the segment tree, um, you can basically do the same types of queries in log n, except on an array rather than on a tree. So it's like the same idea, you like set ai equals k, or you print like the range sum. Um, so yeah, that, we're, again, we're not gonna go into exactly why they work. We're basically just gonna be using the segment tree template that we talked about in that earlier lecture. Okay, so now we can talk about how we want to do our range sums on the tree. Um, so we're given some path query uv, right? And we wanna print out the sum of all the values on that path. And what we can do is split it into segments of the heavy chains. Um, so like we have this piece of the red chain here, then this piece of the green chain, and this piece of the blue chain. Um, and again, like we were talking about before, you have at most log n or O log n of these. Um, and then what we can do is uh, basically make a seg tree on each of these chains. So like one seg tree on these six guys, and then one on these three, and one on these two. And now each one of these queries is just a segment within that segment tree for that chain. Uh, so like for this one, we would do uh, the, a query on the first two elements of this array, the first two elements of this array, and the first two elements of this array. All right, uh, any questions on that? We're, we're basically just, splitting the problem up into a problem we can solve with segment trees. And again, uh, we have at most log n or O log n segments on this chain, uh, on the path. Um, and because the segment tree gives us the answer in log n, um, now our queries are log squared n, because basically log n times log n for each of these chains. And if we want to update a value now, um, all we have to do is update, find the position in the segment tree of that vertex and update that value. So that's actually uh, just O log n. So we save a log factor there as opposed to the queries, which are log squared. All right. Okay. And sorry. yeah. Sorry. sorry. Uh, so uh, there's a question for I keep, I guess. So, so can you do the whole like, associated like monoid stuff and everything. Does that work just fine on this? Uh, I think, yeah. But you, you, I guess you haven't done it, right? Uh, what do you mean? You mean like just a general, like having a general function to compose stuff? So we're going to talk about restrictions on the functions like later. Okay. Because uh, there's, there's some stuff that's like relatively easy to do, but there's some stuff that d just don't do it. Uh, another thing I want to ask is, can you do lazy prop on this? Uh, that's also going to come later. Okay. Gotcha. Nice. Okay. All right. Um, and it turns out, so, okay. So up till now, we were talking about, like, you have a separate seg tree for each of these. Uh, but it turns out there's a much nicer way to represent that. Um, you can do it all in one segment tree. Uh, so the way you do that is you basically put all the chains into an array. Um, so, like, if you look at this example here, we have like the first six correspond to the green chain. Then the next one corresponds to this vertex. Then we have the orange chain and the red chain and so on. So every chain gets like its own 
uh, section of the array. Um, and again, non-overlapping sections, like everything is uh, like contiguous in the same way that the chains are, right? So like these, these six correspond to like these six going down. Um, and uh, all our segtree queries are always within a chain. Um, so this is always going to work, right? Because let's say, again, like we did the example before, we're looking at like these six, you can just query like these two here and these two here and these two here and that just work. Because again, all our queries are within the chains. So this is basically just to make implementation like significantly easier. Okay. Uh, and then the question is um, sort of how do we set this up? How do we assign every vertex a position in uh, this segment tree? And it turns out we can basically just do a DFS for this um, with the one restriction that we have to, when you're DFSing from a vertex, you have to go to its heavy child before you go to any other child. And the way this works is it sort of forces you to travel down the heavy path before you do anything else. So like from the start, we initialize, initially start with uh, index zero. And then we keep going down this heavy path until we run out. And then we keep DFSing down from here. So we do six. And then we DFS down from here. And sort of by DFSing in this order, we're assigning them the indices like in the order we want. We're making sure that the chains stay together, essentially. So questions on this? or on putting it all in one sec tree. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna get into a lot of the uh, implementation details for how to set this up. Um, and it's actually not too bad to do. Um, there is a, a decent amount of code, but it's relatively okay to work with. Okay. All right, so first of all, uh, these are all the arrays that we're going to be storing. Um, so first of all, we're storing the tree. And this is like the standard adjacency list representation. Um, we also want to store the values in the uh, in the vertices. Um, so we're just using t as like uh, the generic like value type here. Uh, so we have like a type def for that. Um, this is just so if you want to like generalize it to some other type with like some other operation that's easier to do. This is like what we do in the seg tree template. Yeah? Wait, did someone say something? OK. Um, then we also store uh, the depth of every vertex, um, the index of every vertex in the segment tree, um, the size of every vertex, uh, the size of the subtree of every vertex. Uh, and then the sort of one like kind of non-trivial thing we're storing is uh, top v which is the lowest ancestor of V that's not in the same chain, which we'll show on the next slide. So is everyone good with uh, all of these? Because these are all, I guess, pretty straightforward in terms of what they're storing. OK. Yeah, so top V. All right, so top V is basically you go up in the chain until you hit the next vertex that's not in the same chain. Um, and one thing that I have is I also attach sort of like a dummy vertex above the root so that this is always like defined. Um, there are ways of working around it if you don't do this, um, but this just makes it a little bit easier to deal with. Um, so like in this example, top of this vertex would be B because this is the lowest ancestor of A, it's not in the same chain. And top of B would be C because this is the lowest ancestor not in the same chain. OK. All right, so now we're going to talk about the segment tree. So this is mostly going to be the same as our normal segment tree template, um, except I, I changed the modify and the query functions so that it's uh, slightly easier to deal with to like put input into it. Um, so note that instead of modifying a specific index in the seg tree. Uh, we're modifying a vertex, right? So that just means we don't have to do the conversion from i to idix i. We can we'll do that inside here. Uh, and query is kind of a bigger change 
um, because rather than looking at L to R, um, we want to query on the first A ancestors of I. So like if A is one, then we're just querying on vertex I itself. If A is two, then it's like I plus its parent. Uh, A is three, then it's like I plus its parent plus its parent parent, and then so on like that. Um, and so the way these two functions are gonna look is, yeah, so basically for the modify, all we change is this P plus equals N to basically be I equals I dx I plus N. Um, and yeah, th this is basically just converting I into the index of I um, and everything else is essentially the same. Um, and then a similar idea for uh, the query function um, here, we wanna basically define L and R based on I and A. Um, and so the rightmost index you wanna look at um, is basically index of I plus one right, because it, it, it's with the seg tree we have, it's like half open. So you want to go one past the index of i. Um, and then the left is going to be r minus a. So basically all this is doing is converting our i a query into an lr query in the seg tree. And everything else below here is the same. All right, uh, any questions on the seg tree? Okay, so then um, our first DFS is um, pretty straightforward. Uh, basically, the main goal is to fill the size array and the depth array. Um, so we set the depth equal to depth of the parent plus one, uh, set the size to one, and then we add all the sizes of the subtrees um, into size i, except for the parent. So if j does not equal the parent, then we add uh, basically size j to size i. Um, and the one sort of non-standard trick we're using here is um, we're then sorting all of our children uh, descending by size. Um, so you sort with this custom comparator uh, where tree i is a list of all your neighbors. Um, and then this gives you all your children in descending size order. Uh, so notice that your parent is gonna be somewhere in this list. Um, but we don't really care about that because we're just going to skip over it. Like we're skipping over it here. Um, and the parent could appear basically anywhere in the list. Um, but again, it doesn't really matter. Because like if you DFS, if this is like your, if your current vertex is like the first child of its parent, then the parent size will still be at like one. But I mean, again, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, and then the second TFS, um, we want to fill the index, top, and seg trees. Uh, so basically the way this works is we have pause, which is like the current position in the seg tree. Um, and we're going to increment that as we add elements into it, right? So like as we go through in DFS order, uh, we increase pause because that's like the position we're adding to. Um, and then, yeah, so for the arguments we're passing in here, uh, I is your current vertex, P is the parent, and then T is basically top I. So we, we set top I to be T, we set uh, index I to be pos plus plus, um, and then we modify vertex I with val I, where val I is just the initial value we got at the beginning for what's stored on this vertex. Okay. And notice that we have to do this after we set index i, because this modify uh, relies on index i being filled. Okay, and then uh, this part here is kind of the weird part of this, where we're sort of passing the top value down to the children. Okay, so the first time we get inside this uh, loop and the if statement is gonna be the heavy child, right? because that's the first thing in tree i that's not equal to the parent. And because we sorted it in the first DFS, that, that has to be our heavy child. So when we go in the first time, t is still this initial t value. So we're passing down the same t value to our heavy child, which makes sense, right? Because if you have two things in the same heavy chain, they have to have the same top value. Because if you go up past the, 
a heavy chain, you hit the same vertex. So we want to pass down the same T for the heavy child. But then for all the light children, we want to pass down I itself, right? Because we're we have a picture somewhere. Yeah, because like here. Um, so let's say we're DFSing down from this vertex. Uh, when we go down to the seven, we want to pass down top equals C, right? Because top of B equals C and top of this vertex also equals C. So we pass down C to this guy. But for all the other children, we want to pass down B as their top because they're all starting new heavy chains. So B is their top. So what we do is after we do the first DFS to the heavy child, we just set T equals I because for all of the children after that, we want I to be their top. Questions on this? Does this make sense? Okay. Because the only time you want to pass down your current top to the next guy is when it's the heavy. And for all the other ones, you are the top now. Okay. So uh, that is all the pre-processing we have to do. Um, so now we just have to do the queries based on the information we stored in the pre-processing. Okay, so the idea of how we're gonna query between A and B is, so if they're in the same heavy chain, then we just need to do a single query on this entry, um, right? Because that's how these work. Cause like, let's say this vertex and this vertex, they're in the same heavy chain. So we just query between them and we return that answer. Otherwise, what we're going to do is we're going to find the like the lowest chain on the path, uh, do the query on that chain, and then remove that from our query and recurse, essentially. So like if we were doing this path, um, we haven't like fully defined what a lowest chain is yet, but this would be our lowest one, sort of intuitively. Um, because like these are all like higher depth basically. Um, so we would do the query here, then remove this from our query. So now we're just looking here. Then this is our new lowest chain. So we would query here. Uh, now we're looking at these two. And then we can detect that these two are on the same chain um, and just do single tech tree query. Okay. So the, the first step to this is detecting if two vertices are on the same chain. Um, and we can do this by checking if depth A minus depth B equals index I minus index B, right? Because if you think about like what this equality means, it means that we DFS down like directly from one vertex to the other, right? Because we sort of, if you know that the difference in their depths is say four, right? So like, let's say we're looking at 23 and this two. Um, we know that the difference in their depth is four. If the difference in their indices is also four, like it's the case here, then we know that the three vertices in between them had to have been those consecutive indices, right? Because uh, to get between here and here, we need to use uh, three indices, right, in the DFS. Like uh, this one is also at um, depth four. So to get between here and, no, th this one is also depth four. So to get between zero and uh, this eight, we had to sort of use three uh, increasing indices. So we know that we have three increasing indices that are in between zero and four, that has to be one, two, and three. So that means we had to have DFS down directly um, from A to B, which means they have to be on the same chain. Um, so if we see that this is true in our query function, we can just return the appropriate seg tree query because we know they're on the same chain. Questions on this? Okay. So if this is not the case, then we know that they're on different chains. So now, we, again, we want to sort of find the lowest chain and do a query there, basically. Um, so the way we do this is looking at top A versus top B. 
Um, so let's assume for now that the depth of top A is less than or equal to the depth of top B. Then we're going to say that the chain from B to top B is our lowest chain. Um, and then we're going to query on this chain using this egg tree. Uh, so we basically go, again, since we're looking, um, since our queries are by uh, vertex comma number of ancestors, the vertex is B, and the number of ancestors we want to check is uh, depth B minus depth top B. Um, so, so that's sort of one reason that we do top B defined to be this rather than the top of the chain. Um, and the other reason we define top B to be that is that now our new chain um, is A to top B. So we don't have to do like an off by one there either. Um, so we're basically just replacing B by top B and then recursing on this chain of four vertices. Okay. Questions? Oh, oh, and then, um, so another important thing. So this is actually why we have the dummy vertex on top here. Um, it's so that you can do this depth check and it works out properly. Because you could define top of everything on this chain to be like the root. But then you could get in a situation where like, let's say you have this vertex and this vertex. So yeah, this is actually what would come up if we did this query and we recursed down to this chain of four. Um, you would see that the depths of their tops are equal. And then you would assume, oh, I can just pick either one. But that's not the case when you're dealing with the root. Um, because if you choose the root and then you move up here, then you're going to sort of like double or maybe triple count the root. Um, but if you define top of everything on the roots chain to be up here, then this depth inequality will work out and you'll be fine. Because then we'll detect, oh, this one is actually the lower chain and we can't do this one yet. All right. Okay. So the code for this is pretty short. Um, basically, this case handles when they're on the same path, and this is when they're on different paths. So, okay, if they're on the same path, this is the check we talked about before. Um, we're going to swap them uh, if depth A is greater than depth B, just so we can assume that um, B is the lower one. And then we're going to query from B um, up by depth B minus depth A plus one, which is sort of the number of ancestors from B to A, including A. So this is just doing the single chain query. And then here, again, we want to make sure that B is sort of the lower one. So we do this swap if we have to. But notice this time we're swapping by the depth of their top values rather than the depths of them. And um, so here we recurse on a query from A to top B, which is just calling this function again. And then we also call the segtree query on B uh, with depth B minus depth top B ancestors. And then this will recurse until eventually we hit this point. Questions on code? So, so, de uh, so top here is not in the chain itself. It's like past the chain. Yes, it's the one just past the end of the chain. And again, the reason for that is um, you can just pass top B in here, and also there's no off by one here. So if you can't like pass top B directly in here, um, then what you have to do is like store a parent array, uh, like globally. Um, which is just a little bit more code to work with. Um, and then this way, you don't need to explicitly store the parent of every vertex. Because you can do everything with top, essentially. OK. And then, uh, so the main method would basically just be you read in the tree. Um, so again, this is like the normal adjacency list. So you add in the bidirectional edges like this. 
um, then you DFS one and DFS two uh, from a vertex one with parent equals n minus one. So n minus one is that dummy vertex we were talking about before. That's like above the root. We don't have to like explicitly add it into the tree. It's enough to um, just pass it in as the parent and as the top vertex um, for these DFS calls. And then for the queries, when we want to query, we can just do query a b or uh, seg tree modify uh, a v with whatever we have to. So this would set uh, val a equals v basically. Okay. All right. So before we get into these like variations, anyone have any questions on the implementation in general? Okay. So first um, is we're going to talk about lazy prop. So for lazy prop, um, you want to be able to query on ranges um, and update ranges. Um, so to get lazy prop on uh, HLD, the hardest part is going to be uh, getting the lazy prop segment tree to work. Um, but once you have the seg tree working, um, it's relatively easy to adapt what we have for lazy prop. Uh, basically, you just have to make a range update function, which is essentially just the range query function, uh, but it updates instead of querying. So it would look basically like this. Um, so again, we do the depth uh, equals index check. We do the swap if we have to. Um, and then we modify on that one chain. Um, and then in the other case, we swap based on the depth at the top if we have to. Um, we modify on the low chain, and we recurse with top B. So this is essentially the same code as we just had for queries, except we are modifying instead of querying. So lazy prop is not too bad to work with here. Um, anything on lazy prop? It's relatively straightforward. Okay, so then another nice trick is, um, so what do we do if the values are on the edges? So like now we want to query, what is the sum of weights of the edges on this path? Um, so sort of the easiest way to modify this to what we already have is if you imagine moving these edge weights down uh, to their lower vertices. So like if you have a tree that looks like this, um, it would end up looking like this. Uh, notice that the root uh, value is like undefined, um, but every other vertex will have like exactly one defined value. And so now if we think about like, what is this change for our uh, queries and all that? Um, so once we set up val, right? Cause initializing val is gonna be kind of tricky here because we're not given the values like for a specific vertex. But once we've set up val and we've assigned every vertex its value, um, there's no changes to pre-processing. And the one change to queries is we no longer want to include the LCA of the path. Because let's say you're looking at like the path from this one or, or from like this four to this four, say. And we want like the sum along this path. Um, so the, the answer we want is 10. Right, because we go along the edge with four and the edge with two and the edge with four. But if we go along this path, this is gonna give us a sum of 12 because we're including the LCA too, um, which we don't want to because this edge never comes into play on that path. So we just want these three edges. So for the queries, we have to modify it to not include the LCA. Um, but it turns out we can just do this by removing the plus one here. Because um, that's basically querying one less ancestor when they're on the same path. So you're going basically up to one below the LCA um, and then stopping. So that basically just works on cutting out the LCA. Um, so this, this is the only change you need to make to either the DFS functions or the, the queries. Um, does this make sense?
Okay. And then we have to do um, a little bit of setup in the main method to make this work. Um, so uh, basically you want to store, wait, were you saying something? I, I keep hearing noises like people are saying something. Okay. Um, so yeah, you also want to store vectors for the edges and the weights, like in the order you receive them. Um, and then after your first DFS, but before your second DFS, um, you want to go through and fill a val. Um, so basically, you uh, make sure that edges i dot first is the one with the bigger depth, um, where we're representing edges i as a pair. Um, so, so this what this swap is doing is just making sure that edges i dot first is the lower one, and edges i dot second is its parent. And once we have that, we just set val edges i dot first equal to weights i. Um, and storing these uh, vectors is very important because you'll often get queries that'll be like, uh, switch the value of the ith edge. And this way you can just look at edges i dot first um, and update that val. So go to like that position in the seg tree. Um, so, so this is basically useful for both the setup here and also the queries. All right. Um, and then, so the last uh, sort of special case we're going to talk about um, is if you have a non-commutative combiner function. So up till now, we've been basically just working with addition. Um, so then the question is, what if we're using something that's not commutative? Um, and this makes it like significantly more difficult to implement. Uh, because if you think about it, now you need two separate seg trees. You need one for querying a path going up and one for querying a path going down. Because if your operation is not commutative, you need to sort of split your, uh, your path into the part that goes up and the part that goes down. And then you need to like do a separate seg tree query for each of those two halves and then combine those. Uh, can you um, not pass in a parameter into the seg tree query function to, to when it combines res l and res r to just flip that or something? Um, you probably could do something like that. In general, you don't need two segment trees, right? You can always combine it as a pair. That's true. You, you could do it as a pair. Um, but the other, sort of the bigger reason that I'm against doing non-commutative stuff with this is the HLD query function is so much more complicated. Because um, if you notice, we were doing like a lot of swapping with A versus B and stuff like that, um, which you can no longer do, really, if you're uh, doing non-commutative. I guess you could pass in a Boolean and like sort of toggle the Boolean if you swap. Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess that would work. Um, but uh, again, you're adding just a lot more complexity. So all right, maybe it is possible to implement if you do, if you have like a Boolean, um, but it, it does make it significantly more complicated and we're not gonna go into like specifics about implement that. Um, yeah, that just gets a lot harder. Okay, uh, any questions? All right, so now we're gonna get into the problems. Um, and so with these problems, it's hard to find HLD like query problems that aren't just like, oh, use the seg tree and then do HLD. Um, so with these problems, they're not actually uh, HLD query problems. So we're not really using like the whole seg tree aspect of it, which is like what we were talking about for most of this. Um, but this is these are gonna be problems that use like the idea of the heavy versus light edges and like the login things we get there um, without having to do the queries. Cause there's a lot of interesting stuff we can do with that. Okay. So the first problem is carpet um, where you have a tree of like 10 to the fifth vertices and you want to arrange its nodes on integer points of a 20 by 10 to the sixth grid such that none of, its none of its edges cross each other. So like if you were given a tree that looks like this, you could put them on these positions and this would be okay because none of these edges cross. And here we have uh, circles for these. 
but uh, you can imagine the vertices as points. So again, the idea is this isn't really like an HLD query problem with like a seg tree or anything like that, but it's still using the idea of like heavy versus light edges. So one hint is 20 is bigger than log n. Oh wait, so so each chain is like max log n. Um you can have each chain the chain like direction growing the chains in the twenty direction. So and have everything thing, else goes in the other direction. That's kind of the right idea, except the heavy chains can be like very long. Those can be like up to n. Because like imagine if you had just uh your tree was just like a single chain going down from the root. Then that would be like one heavy chain all the way down. Um, the login guarantee you get is that you have at most login of the light edges on every path. So th that's sort of the right idea. You just have to kind of swap the heavy and the light. And there's like a little bit of an extra step, but yeah, it's close. I'm like having a hard time visualizing, so I'm not sure like how to like do the details, yeah. but like I'm guessing the idea is right, like uh, starting from like the top, like you put a heavy chain. And then you kind of want all your like light edges to go to the next row or something. Um, and then like you put all your heavy chains again, and then all your light edges go to the next row. So like you guarantee to like not use more than like 20, um, because like every time you're going down one, you use the light edge. Um, but I don't know how to actually line them up. I don't know if that works. Yeah, so that, that works. That's the okay. solution. Um, and what you can do is uh, basically iterate through all the vertices in the current row in order and then put all of the vertices adjacent to them uh, put all those chains in sort of in order too. So th this is a very hard thing to explain uh, like verbally. So we also have a picture for this. So like, um, yeah, I did it starting from the bottom, but it's like the same idea. Um, so if this is our tree, um, you start with your heavy chain that includes the root. Um, and now we want to look at all of the chains that are adjacent to that chain by a light edge. So in that case, that, this, that would be the blue chain, the green, green chain, and these three chains of size one. And what you do is you sort of look at these four vertices in order, and you look at all the light edges adjacent to them. And every time you see a light edge here, you put in the full heavy chain in the next row. Uh, so we see the blue chain here, we attach it. We see the green chain here, we attach it. Um, and then we do the same with these chains as we sort of go along this path. Um, and then once this is done, we go to the next row 
and we do the same thing. So we iterate through all of these vertices in order and add all of the edges uh, to all the light edges we haven't seen yet here. So like the orange and the pink. Um, and if there were more down here, we would keep adding them like there. Like let's say we had a light edge from the purple, we would add an edge here. And because we're sort of going through these in order, we're guaranteeing that none of these will ever touch. So these uh, edges might get like extremely like flat and they might get very close to each other like we're seeing here. Um, but as long as you do it in order, they're never gonna cross. All right, uh, any questions on this one? Oh, this is kind of tangential. I just want to make sure. Like, so the log in bound is like like a strict like log two. Like it cannot be above that, right? It's not asymptotic. Yeah. Um, it. I, I'm pretty sure it's strict. I know it's definitely like within like one or like two or something. Okay. Because like pretty, I'm pretty sure it is. Good. The, the, the point is that if you're going down a light edge, right? Then there's some like other child that has at least as many edges as this guy. Yeah. So like it has a, at least yeah. half, or sorry, yeah. at most half in this thing yeah so like definitely within like one of strict and probably strict gotcha. yeah i'm pretty sure it's strict okay yeah so this um this 20 was actually like overkill because i think you only need like maybe like 17 or something for it to work okay and then um our last problem uh, this was a div2f a while ago, um, where uh, it's an interactive problem uh, where there's a hidden node x in a tree um, where you're given the tree uh, and you want to find x in at most 36 queries. So the tree is rooted at vertex 1, and you have two types of queries where you can query the distance from x to a given vertex or um, you can do SU, which gives the second vertex on the path from U to X. But uh, if you ever call SU on a vertex where U is not an ancestor of X, this immediately gives you WA. So you have to make sure that you only call this on um, an ancestor of X. Um, and again, we have 36 queries uh, and log N is strictly less than 18. So I'll give you guys a minute to think about this, but um, you're probably gonna need a few hints for this one because I never would have gotten this without looking at the editorial. But if you guys have like any observations, feel free to say because there's a lot of steps. Actually, I'll give you guys the first hint now because it's a useful way to start thinking about the problem. Um, so the path from the root to the node to any node uses at most log n light edges. Um, so what we're going to try to do is travel down, start at the root, and we want to travel down one light edge of the path at a time uh, using two queries. Uh, and then after login steps, we're okay. So how could we sort of, I guess at this point, just use any number of queries to go down one light edge. I'm not sure of the details. Intuitively, it seems like we want to use the first type of query to get right to the top node, basically, and use the second type of query to go down the light edge. Um, but yes, yeah. So that's basically the idea. Um, 
yeah, so I, I think I can show you guys the next. Yeah, so this is basically what Keith was talking about. Um, so what we want to do is we have like some current root, right? Um, and we want to basically find y, which is the vertex above the light edge we want to travel down. Um, so if we let like u be the, so u is like the head of our heavy chain, v is like the end. Um, oh, also before we do anything, we want to use one query to do uh, d1, which gives you the depth of x. So that's just using one query, um, like at the beginnings, so that's outside of all of our log stuff. Ah, um, I think uh, you want to call d on v. And then since you know the depth of x, you know exactly how far up you have to go from v before you start going down towards x. Exactly. Um, yes, yeah, so we, we know the depths of u, v, and x. And we want to get basically the depth of y. Because once we know the depth of y, we know what y is. Because we just travel up this chain until we get to that depth. And so the way we do that is, uh, like Adam said, we query the distance from v to x. Because notice that the distance from v to x is um, the uh, the depth of v, depth of x plus depth of v minus two times depth of y, right? Because if you think about it in two segments, it's depth of v minus depth of y, which is this many edges, plus depth of x minus depth of y, which is this many. So then we get this equation. Um, so by querying dv, we know this, we know this, and we know this. So we can solve for depth of y. Uh, so now we want to find our next u, right? Because u is like the head of this heavy chain. So we can't have y be our u um, because it has to be like the head of the chain. Um, so we need to find sort of which one of the children of y we want to go to. Um, so how can we do that? Call the second query on y. Exactly. Yeah. We have this other type of query that basically just does exactly that. Um, so if we query sy, it gives you the second vertex on the path from y to x, which gives you this w, and then we can recurse. Um, so there's actually one step I sort of skipped here. Um, so once we find y, um, if depth x equals depth y, um, then we know that x equals y, right? Uh, because we know that y is an ancestor of x. So if they're at the same depth, we just return y at that point. So that's sort of our stopping condition. That's when we like break out of this loop. Um, but otherwise, if it's not at the same depth, um, then we just go to w and we keep repeating. And so notice um, at every, each of these steps is taking two queries, right? Because we're doing one depth v, one second y. Um, so at, in total, we're using at most two log n plus one for that initial depth of x query. Um, and because, um, log n is strictly less than 18, um, we're OK, because this will take us at most 35 queries. All right, um, any questions on this problem? OK. All right, uh, so thank you guys for coming. Uh, as always, we have uh, problems and resources here. Um, and yeah, so the slides are on Discord, and we'll get the video up soon. Wait, a lot of these problems actually use HLB. No, they use, that's what I said. It's not like the queries. It's like the, the heavy versus light. Because like, I looked I looked around for problems that used like the, the seg tree thing. But like, they're all just like, do the HLD. So it's like, it's not like an interesting one to like talk about. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I mean, actually, I did find one that was using like an actual HLD. But that was like, it was like insane. It was like a div one E or F. I, I did not think we'd be able to get through that. But. Even yeah. carpet, right? You have to call HLD. You have to call like the first or second DFS and then use that part. And it's not the query. I, I, I understand the setup involves heavy light edges, but yeah. I was like, wait, we didn't use the actual queries. Yeah. Because like you could like like not really think of this as HLD, right? You could just do the log and observation and then like do it, right? Yeah, but I mean, you still need to set up like the heavy and the light. So yeah.
last year when we taught HLD, we didn't teach like the queries at all. We just taught like this is what a heavy edge is. So, but yeah. All right, yeah, so thank you guys for coming.